Okay, I think we can get started. Uh, Boker Tov, everybody. We are uh, continuing to prepare what we're at Mishnah Perak Beit in my Mishnah Yud. Yeah. Mishnah Yud. We're discussing the uh, actually Mish, Mishnah Yud Aleph. We're going to start Rabbi Yoshua. We're discussing the five students of Rabbi Yochanan Ben Zakkai. That seems to be a interesting number when it comes to rabbinic students. Uh, Rabbi Yochanan Ben Zakkai had five students. The Gemara says Rabbi Akiva had five students. There were the five. But the five students at the uh, Bnei Brak in uh, at the Pesach Seder. I don't know. Somehow interesting. They mention who who are the five major students. So that we discussed a couple of weeks ago. The individual character traits, at least of some of the rabbis. Some rabbis we know a lot more about than others. Uh, often what we do know we gather from what their their teachings are. So uh, we uh, last week we discussed Rabbi Eliezer. Um, you should be uh, very much honoring your your friend and your neighbor. And then we ended off discussing sort of the relationship to rabbis um, or to authority that you have to you have to like heat and light. Um, you can get heat if you're you're far if you can get light if you're far away. But you, to get heat, you have to be close. And there's there's this like tension in our tradition about how close a student should get to um, a teacher. There is a sort of a strain in our tradition that I would say that when it comes to you know Torah is so holy and so powerful and so electrifying, it's it's dangerous. It's like if you get too close, it can kill you. Like like Nadav and Avihu, you know, probably got too close. And there's this notion you have to be be'ema, be'ira, with fear and trembling. And when you learn, and that was the original custom, people used, used to stand when they learned Torah. How, how can you sit when you learn Torah? You have to stand, like 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 nervous, like when you're in court, you have to stand. The, the litigants have to stand in a, in, in a court case, whatever. So that's the one sort of idea that Torah is very... Um, you have to tremble before Torah, as we read in the Torah at Mamar Har Sinai, the trembling of the of, of, the, of the Jewish people. That's on the one hand. I, today, uh, it's probably not a style that works so well. In other words, there's this other hand, of course, you want to get close, and uh, the closer you are, the more you learn, and uh, we know we have, have students questioning their teachers, et cetera, et cetera. But there is this little bit of... Um, of um, notion that one should be kind of distant from the authorities of Torah. But like I mentioned, I think in the, the generation we live in today, that system doesn't work so well. People have to feel a little bit closer to their teachers. There have to be, a, you know, like I, I think I, I mentioned before, it's, uh, I think it's true. Uh, it, you know, it's important that a student like a teacher, otherwise they're not going to learn. Anyway, but there is this um, the, this tension between how close you should get. Uh, but here the Mishnah was saying that um, in order to really learn, it's got to be like um, heat. You got to be close by. If you learn just from a distance, you really can't um, can't get so far. That's why like when Rabbi Akiva went to, uh, when Moshe Rabbeinu went to the Beit Midrash of Rabbi Akiva, he sat in the back, you know, everybody knows that. If you're not too into something, you know, go to a to shul and you're, you don't know anybody or you're in a strange city, so you always sit in the back. You know, nobody notices you. If you want to really get involved in what's going on, you have to move up to the front. So that's a, the same thing. You want to get involved in Torah, you got to move up to the front. You got to be close. You got to be like uh, the, on the one. Got to get the heat of the rabbis. But watch that their their bite is like a snake or um, a scorpion. Okay, let's. Oh, move Rabbi, on. I have a question. Uh, what about the uh, the Shabbos Shuva Drasha? and fear and all of that, does that carry the same degree of awe and reverence? Listen, yeah, so, listen, forth so you know, there, there was a custom, I know some people gave the Shabbos Agadol and Shabbos, you know, Shuva Josh, it's really, you know, that's sort of a Eastern European invention, I think, that um, the rabbi would wear a talis when he spoke. It's, uh, it was right, it was a very formal um, occasion. Listen, it's, um, I remember, um, Rav Shechter once describing to us the difference between the Pesach Seder of Rav Chaim, Rav Chaim Brisker, Rav Chaim Soloveitchik, and the Nitziv. A lot of it is your personal attitude. Rav Chaim Soloveitchik, you know, very nervous. Uh, you know, is it, how, what's the shear of the kazite? How big is the wine? Uh, you know, are we drinking enough? Every, everybody, they're very nervous about the lachet, not relaxed. You know, there are certain people like that. And halacha can sometimes make you like that. You know, uh, it, it has so many details. It can, you know, it can, someone who can drive you, you know, crazy in a sense. And, and then the sea was much more relaxed, uh, enjoy, fun. You know, so a lot of it is um, a personal thing. But, um, you know, how... 
how uh, awe inspiring. I, like I said, I don't know that I don't know that that works today. But we'll we'll discuss a little bit more hopefully later today on sort of on on the Muslim movement um, a little bit. But um, you know, uh, this in the rabbi's speech is and uh, what, whatever works best. That's what you're supposed to. We've mentioned the number. We mentioned once before that Rav used to tell a joke before every shear. That's a very different approach. You know, because if you want to loosen up people, you want to relate to people, you begin with a joke. And I mentioned Rav Schechter used to tell us there's a debate in the commentaries. Is the joke only allowed at the beginning of the class? Like before you start to warm people up. But once you're actually learning, you shouldn't tell jokes. And some say no, even in the middle. I think we live in a generation, you have to, to tell jokes. If anybody heard Rav Schechter speak, he has a great sense of humor. He would tell jokes in the middle of the show. I mean, not like he wouldn't stop and tell, tell a story, but you know, a, a speaker can speak in a way that's very cute and with um, a sense of humor. So whatever, it depends on the approach that works. But there are some rabbis who are very distant. There, there were, um, I don't want to start mentioning names now, but there was a, a famous Rosh Hashiva that when you went to meet with him, you had to walk out of the room backwards. You know, some people at the Kotel, they won't turn their back. In other words, they walk away from the Kotel facing the Kotel because it's not nice to turn your back. So there was a, there was a famous Rosh Hashiva. You had to turn your... Um, I don't know if it was, I'm not saying he was personal, he felt, but of, out of Kavad Hator, respect for the Torah, you don't turn your back on a Rosh Hashiva, you walk out of the room facing him. I mean, so these are different um, approaches to, you know, how we, uh, how we relate to people. Or when I was in Yeshiva, when I came to Israel in Yeshiva, so I found it extremely strange. I could never do this, where you have students would talk to their Rebbeim, talk to their Rosh Hashiva in third person. The, the Rav said, the Rabbi said, and I think Rav Lichtenstein told us once, he, he very, felt very uncomfortable with that. You know, uh, I would feel very uncomfortable if somebody spoke to me in third person. But for some people, that's a great mark of respect and honor. So, um, you know, you have to know who you're dealing with, who you are. And like all these things, um, it changes. That's probably the reason why when it comes to mitzvot between man and man, there's very little in the Torah um, describing the, the mitzvot. In other words, how do you define honoring your friends? I, for, forget just in the Torah, um, in our halakhic codes. Kibbut Ava'im, let's say, which is an extremely important mitzvah, is one siman, I believe, in the Shulchan Aruch. That's it. A few halachas. Because how it applies changes from generation to generation. I think, you know, um, also the relationship between kids and parents is much different than it used to be a few generations ago, the relationship between teachers and students. So these halakhas are not codified because the definition of respect can often change from generation. There's certain objective things. I'll even, if you want a, a little bit more controversial, and even in the area of, of tzniyut, the, uh, the, the definition of sniyut was never really defined in Judaism because it couldn't be defined and it should not be defined because every generation is a little bit different. Today, we live in an era where people like to define everything, you know, exactly how big an olive is or how, you know, how much, uh, how long the sleeve has to be or how this. It's, I think uh, it's not the way the halachic system used to work. Maybe there are reasons for it in our generation, but, but a lot of things... Um, uh, you know, Hilchot Shabbos is more objective. What's allowed in one generation, you know, it doesn't change much. I mean, there are new technologies you have to figure out, but the, the halakhas aren't going to change. But how, how to honor somebody or how to interact or how to learn Torah, that changes from generation to generation. And therefore, the halakha was very well aware of that and just gave very broad outlines, allowing people to develop it with their own generation. Okay, hope that answered the question. But let's get to Rabbi Yoshu. We got a few things to discuss. Ayin Hara, this is Perak uh, Beit Mishnah Yud Aleph, 2.11 in my Mishnah. Ayin Hara, a bad eye, the Yetzer Hara, an evil inclination, the Sinat Habriyot, that we'll talk about, of course, leading up to Tisha B'av, the hatred of creation, Motzi'im et Hadam Min Holam, remove somebody from the world. Um, these three things, so that's a, also a very interesting expression, remove you from the world. So is that like you, it kills you internally or you're punished? It's a very, like we sometimes have an expression, like uh, a, a person does something, he's guilty of a death penalty. But that's not what it says here. It's not that you're guilty. What we're saying here is if you have these traits, if you have a, a bad eye, we'll just find that in a minute with this, it will, it will kill you. You know, it'll, it'll create stress, give you a heart condition, it'll give you all kinds of terrible things. Ayin Hara, we discussed a few weeks ago when Rabbi Yochanan Menzaka asked his students. Very interesting, it was Rabbi Eliezer 
who said that ein tov and ein ra are the good and the bad traits. Now, good eye we define generally as not to be jealous. A good eye means your, your neighbor has more than you, you smile, you're very happy um, for him. You don't look down, you know, we know a good eye. You give somebody a look, a glare, that says it all. You don't have to say anything. So ein ra is generally basically how we relate to other people, how we look at the other people. Um, are we jealous of them? So I, I don't have to tell you how that can kill you. If your whole life is spent, you know, I have to be number one. You know, we live in a world where all people, it's, you know, in the, in the business world, it's your market share. They don't even care necessarily as much as how much, um, you know, I, I don't want to have to mute everybody, mute everybody again, but there is a little bit of background noise. So if somebody has their um, um, uh, mute off, please turn it off. Um, okay. Other way. Um, so um, we, we, that uh, companies care very much market share, often sometimes more than revenue and profit. I understand that on a certain level, but on a certain level, it's actually very sad if you're doing well. Like, so somebody else is also doing well, Baruch Hashem. The famous story, you know, the, the, the Chavetz Chaim, okay, we're not the Chavetz Chaim, you know, they owned a little store. And everybody, when they opened up a store, he didn't want to make a living from, from Torah. That was the classical approach. So uh, him and his wife opened up a, a store and everybody went shopping and run into his store. Because uh, the Chafetz Chaim, you have to support him. So he felt that wasn't right. It was hurting the other merchants. So he only opened up a store, I don't know, two hours a day. So everybody went shopping during those two hours. So he closed the store. You know, I don't know if the story is true, but uh, all right. And I don't know that we have to do that. But uh, the idea that it's okay that other people do well. There's, there's no mitzvah for you to have 100% you know, your market share. Anyways, so Ein Hara, now talk a little bit about Yetzer Hara, an evil inclination. So an evil inclination can kill you. We, we know uh, the hate, we have uh, Yetzer Hara, you know, how uh, well, everybody knows what our Yetzer Hara is. Everybody, again, has their own individual Yetzer Hara. I think that, uh, you know, that's, everybody has to know what their area that they have to work on. We also know the, Med, the Medrash famously says that without the Yetzer Hara, we couldn't live. Uh, without the Yetzir Hara, there would be no children. Without the Yetzir, nobody would engage in business. You, it is good to want to do well in business. Being wealthy is not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing to strive for, as long as it's in perspective. As long as you don't have an Ein Hara for other people. I don't mean Ein Hara the way people use it. You know, an Ein Hara means uh, how you look upon o- o- other people. So we need a Yetzir Hara that, that God created with the Yetzir Hara, because without the Yetzir Hara, we wouldn't do anything. There is a, I don't know if the people are familiar, a relatively, I don't know if it's relatively well known, I think. The Gemara says that, um, and I guess their aunts, they were bothered by the fact, you know, if, if you read now, we're doing a series on, on Tanakh. It's really a very fascinating series. I invite everybody to join. We've just finished Nevim Rishonim. So we got uh, nine of the 24 books done, one book in every class. So you read Nevim Rishonim. It's like unbelievable. Uh, of the Avodah Zara, the idolatry, worshiping idols and Baal and all kinds of crazy things. It's just really um, astounding. What, what was the draw of people to a vote art. So that's a fascinating question we're, don't, we're not going to get into now. Well, it, wasn't, it wasn't some simplicity. They didn't worship an idol and think it was a more sophisticated. It wasn't so silly. They had a sophisticated approach, how it worked a little bit. But what was the draw? We don't have that draw anymore. Uh, we don't have people doing that. We have people not observant, but uh, we don't have people who don't worship anybody. But the idea of worshiping Baal and sacrifice and even human sacrifice, you know, they were so close to their gods that they would offer human beings, which on a certain level makes sense. Uh, the the Akeda, the all Akeda stories to show us we, we don't want to do that. But there, there's something to it. In other words, God asking Abraham to sacrifice his son, that does demonstrate your love of, of God. So, uh, so the Torah came along and said, no, so we, we don't have these desires. So the Gemara says, because the sages prayed, whatever that means, they prayed to God that God should nullify the desire for a Vodazar. And he did. And he did. And th- that was it. And um, But you know what happened when God nullified the desire for Yetzir Hara, as we've discussed a number of times, Newton's third law of motion, what applies in the physical world, applies in the spiritual world. If people don't have a yearning for idolatry, they have less of a yearning for for God. In other words, the religious yearning went away. When the rabbis prayed to get rid of the um, Yetzir Hara for Avodah Zara, it impacted on our desire to worship God. And that's why so many people are not observant. Uh, And there's have no 
God is not part of their, their lifestyle at all. And I've mentioned many times, I think from Rev Cook, I heard this verse from Rev Rev Igmar, Rev, Rev Shlomo Gmar, those of you in, in Toronto know him, um, that uh, Avodah Zara is, is not all bad. In other words, it's Avoda. Avodah's worship of God. That went for, and there's something went wrong with it. But the idea, it, it begins as Avodah. They're searching for God. Halavai. It's, it's wonderful they're searching for God. Their search for God is a little mistaken, and the Torah makes a big deal that it's a little mistaken. It's Zara. So that got lost. When we lost the Yetzir Hara for worshiping God in the negative way, we also lost the desire to worship God in the positive way. You have to work hard on it. That's, and then the Gemara says, oh, that worked. That was a neat trick. So the Gemara says, let's get rid of the avoda, of the Yetzir Hara, the inclination for Gilu'a Rayot, for sexual immorality. So uh, that was a cool thing. And, uh, and that's what happened. That happened. Uh, that was it. There were no eggs to eat anymore. Nobody had children. That was it. Uh, and the rabbi said, uh-uh, this ain't working. Uh, we got to get back the desire for, for sexual immorality because otherwise uh, people won't marry. People won't have kids. So, um, so you know, you see it, one went to the other. It's injured. Obviously, the, if the rabbis felt it was worth it, uh, to harm our worship of God, to get rid of a uh, You And if you read the Torah Shabbat, because we don't live in such an environment, we don't feel it the same way. But in the Torah Shabbat, Avodah Zara is such an overarching theme. I mean, Sefer Dvarim, that's really the whole book. Sefer Dvarim is Moshe Rabbeinu warning the people all, every, every week, don't be like the, the seven nations. Don't intermarry them. We're going to read next week, intermarriage. Uh, everything, it's all about don't, don't worship God in many places like they do. We have one place to worship God. It's all about Avodah Zarah is such a major theme, the, fir the first two of the Ten Commandments. Um, that's in later sort of Jewish life, it doesn't become, it's not such a major theme because uh, we don't have so much av Avodah Zarah. So the rabbis were willing, were, were happy to get rid of Avodah Zarah, even it came at the cost of our worship of God. Of course, they couldn't get rid of Gilei Rayot if it came at the cost of uh, of a proper sexual relations, because then we wouldn't be here. So uh, they they had to allow the Yetzir Har for Yekila. In other words, you can't have one without the other. That's what we always say. You can't have good without evil. You can't have evil without good. The greater the potential, the evil. The greater the potential for good. So that's a bat. It's misuse Yetzir Har. Misuse Yetzir Har can kill you. It can literally kill you. You know, you do things that are are wrong and dangerous. And also, one who has you know such desires for always doing things, it's not good for them. Okay, but let's talk a little bit more on Sinat HaPriyot since we're in the, in the nine days in Tisha B'Av this week. Sinat HaPriyot, hating people. So we know that if you don't like people, it also creates a lot of stress. Creates a lot of stress for people. So what, what is the definition of Sinat HaPriyot? So, um, so the Bartonura says, and we'll start with that because I guess leading to Tisha B'Av, it's what we call, what the Talmud calls Sinat Chinam, um, which by the way is not such an easy term to translate, Sinat Chinam. So what do we call it? Needless hatred, causes hatred, um, free hatred. China means no, no price. A uh, shomer China. He watches something without getting paid. And what do you mean China? Everybody has a reason for hating somebody. The reason might not be good, but there's no, in other words, it's not that there's no reason. Okay, maybe that's what it means. Sina China. Not a good reason is needless. But I really think Sina China is not necessarily, this is a little bit, you know, harder and, and scarier. It doesn't necessarily mean hatred. Um, it, it can mean that, of course, but what it more likely means is apathy. Um, you're apathetic about other people. What's ahava, the opposite of sinah, is love, is, is caring. So if love is caring, and every, that's what we just said, yetzer hara, yetzer tov, every, ayin tov, ayin ra, chaver tov, chaver ra, that's what's Rav Yochanan and Zaka, you know, one to the other. So um, sina and ahava, have to work together. So if ava means love, in Aramaic, the word hav is to give to others. Ava means you give to others, you care. So sina just means I, I don't give to others. I'm apathetic about people, I don't care about people, etc. Um, okay, I I um I just I'm I'm just curious. Are people here familiar with the beautiful uh, explanation? That's uh, you, you often hear it. I I I hope you hear it every year on Tisha B'av. It's worthy to hear every year on Tisha B'av or any time. The Nitziv's definition of Sinat Chinam. If you want to have a, a show of hands, I'm, I'm just curious if people are aware of his introduction to Sefer Sefer Bereshit. Naftali Yehuda Berlin, the great Rosh Yeshiva in Velazhin. Should, should I go on with it? I, I don't know what people uh, 
it's hard talking to a screen. Okay, so the Netziv was the um, Naftali Sihud of Berlin, had uh, two famous children, 50, 48 years apart uh, in age. Uh, whatever, we're not going to go the whole biography of the Netziv, but he was the great Rosh Yeshiva of the Velazhin Yeshiva, the Harvard of the Yeshiva world, uh, founded by Rav Chaim of Velazhin, uh, the great student of the Vilna in 1803, closed in 1892. Um, and then it's Steve headed the yeshiva for the last 39 years. He was the Rosh Yeshiva. And um, he had um, his wife died, and then he married his niece. The, uh, his niece very much wanted to marry him. She was, you know, 36 younger years younger than he was, and they thought she was crazy and said, no, no, such an honor to marry. And um, they had a son, uh, Mayor. And that son, uh, Mayor, was a Zionist, as was his father. The Nesiv was a big supporter. I mean, the Nesiv died in 1893, a year after they closed the yeshiva. Uh, but the Nesiv was a supporter of the, the Chov of Zion. His son got very involved in the Zionist movement, Mayor, and, they, and then he recised his name to Bar Ilan, Berlin. And when Bar Ilan University was founded, they named Bar Ilan University. That's the, uh, stu that's the grandson. That's the son of the Nitziv. The, the granddaughter of the Nitziv married Shaul, Shaul Lieberman from uh, Slobodka, the JTS, the Yon Tosef, the Shaul Lieberman married the Nitziv's granddaughter. I mean, everybody, they all married each other, all the great, great Torah scholars, um, families. And uh, Rav, um, Rav Chaim Soloveitchik uh, married also, in, uh, married the Nitziv's granddaughter. Um, any, um, yeah, Rav Chaim Soloveitchik married the, the Nitziv's also granddaughter. Anyways. Um, so um, the, the Nesiv was very unique as a Rosh Yeshiva in many ways. And he, he wrote a commentary in the Sheiltot, a book that nobody had opened up in a thousand years. I mean, maybe that's a slight exaggeration, but it probably isn't much of an exaggeration. Sheiltot was the first Kaonic work written after the time of the first major work. And it was sort of an ignored work. And the Nesiv wrote a commentary on it uh, when he was a youngster. Brilliant. That's a, that showed his, um, his brilliance. Rav Lichtenstein gave Shirim for a couple of years on the Shiltot, on the, his commentary on the, the Shiltot. Um, anyway, the Nesiv, what was also unusual for Rosh Yeshiva in the 19th century, was he wrote a commentary on the Chumash. The commentary on the Chumash is based on his Shirim. He gave a Shir every day in the Lush and Yeshiva on, on Chumash after dappling, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes a day to learn Chumash. It's very unusual. That, I, I, maybe it's unfortunate that's unusual, but it is unusual. And that's written up in the Amek Dabar. So then even his introduction to Bereshit, even though he doesn't spell it out, he's clearly bothered by the following when question. And the question is, the Gemara in Yuma, where it discusses the reason for the destruction of the temple, that's a whole other subject, but we'll focus just on this Gemara. It's what I mean, the reason. But with this Gemara, the famous Gemara, that because of Sinat Chinam, the first temple was destroyed because of the three cardinal sins of idolatry, adultery, and murder. And the Gemara then asks, of Amikdash Sheni, but what about the second temple? I don't get it. The Jewish people, are you oskim betorah mitzvot ugmilut chasadim? That's how the Gemara introduces. In the second temple, the Jews were very involved in Torah. They learned Torah. Mitzvot, they kept the mitzvot of the Torah. And they did gmilut chasadim. And they did acts of kindness to one another. They did the basic, the most wonderful things in Judaism. So why in the world was the temple destroyed? The Gemara says, you know why? Because of sinat chinam. Because of whatever causes hatred, needless hatred, apathy, what, whatever you want to say, lilam dechat to teach you sheshkula. It's equal. Sinat chinam is equal or even worse than the three cardinal sins of idolatry, adultery, and murder. So that in itself is a powerful gemara. We should stop and think about it and just incorporate what that gemara says. Unbelievable that it's worse because the gemara says the first temple was rebuilt after seventy years. This temple uh, we're we're still waiting nineteen almost two thousand years later. And the Talmud says every generation they don't rebuild it as if we destroyed it. In other words, you know, we think we're so great. If we would have been alive, saying a temple, we have the same sin. If we didn't have the same sin, we'd rebuild the the temple. Whatever that means. But uh, so then it's see, uh, but that gemara doesn't make any sense. If the Talmud says they were doing milut chasadim. Isn't Kmilu Chasadim and Sinachinam opposites? Aren't they, uh, aren't they, how, it's, a, it's, it's a contradiction. The Gemara says, but in the second temple period, the Jews were involved in acts of kindness. Surrendous Chasad. So why was it destroyed? Because they didn't get along with one another. They didn't like one another. You just said they liked one another. They helped one another. So then it's see, he, he doesn't ask that question, but that's clearly what's, uh, I think, what's, what's motivating. I mean, it's a one-page introduction to the book of, a Bereshit, which is a phenomenal introduction. And he says that, you know what the problem is? They did selective chesed, what I call selective chesed. 
That's a, we do great chesed, but only to the people who are in our in-group. The people in our out-group, uh, we have nothing to do with them. So, and he explains that this was the terrible sin of the Second Temple. They were very pious Jews. They were learned. I mean, I don't know if that's whatever. They were pious uh, Jews, but what was the problem? Everybody who was different in their religious practice than they were, they looked down upon. And of course, it was L'shem Shemaim, he explains. Of course, they did it for the sake of heaven. After all, you know, I want to serve as God. And this Shmendrik is not serving God. I have to look down upon him. I have to throw stones at him. And I have to, I don't mean that in a literal sense. I mean, you know, I have to figuratively throw stones. And then it seems scared. And anybody who was different, they totally excluded him. And um, he said that's, that was the, and, and he wrote, they were, were tzaddikim L'shem Shemaim. And then he writes something that's beyond powerful. He says, God hates, that's the word he used, God's so nay, God hates these types of righteous people. God hates the righteous maybe more than any other people who we, in other words, we expect more from the righteous. Maybe because they're righteous, he hates them. He hates them if they do this selective chesed. If you don't believe me, look it up. Um, it's an introduction to the Nesiv. And then he, why is this the introduction to the book of Bereshit? Because he says, this is what Bereshit is written. That's the theme of Bereshit, to teach you how to get along with people. Abraham prayed for Stom. That's the example he uses, right? The Torah doesn't begin with the Jewish people. The Torah begins with humanity. You have to get along with everybody. We don't meet Abraham until the 20th generation. And then and they, Yitzchak, everybody's making peace treaties and uh, getting along and teaching what we care and how, how Yaakov treated love and how honestly he worked, et cetera, et cetera. And he says... That Sefer Breshid is just known as Sefer HaYashar. We're going to read it right up next Shabbos, Beth Hanan, Basita HaYashar Vatov, to the right and the straight. And Sefer HaYashar is Breshid, because the difference, we explained this before, a tzaddik is our relationship to God, but a yashar is our relationship to man. And God hates the tzaddikim who aren't yasharim. To be a yashar and not a tzaddik, okay, at least you're halfway there. To be a tzaddik and a yashar, you have nothing. Maybe it's it's negative, because the famous Gemara in Yuma, that discusses the mitzvah to love God. So the Gemara interprets, remember, there are no vowels in, in, the, in the Torah. So the, the Gemara reads it on a, a secondary level of interpretation, not to take away from that you have to love your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. The second level of interpretation is hafta, and you shall cause others to love. You should bring the love of God, not that you should love God, but because of your actions, other people will love God. And the Gemara says, how do you do that? It says, if you learn Torah and you do mitzvot and you're honest in business, you do your business dealings with faithfully, honestly, you get along with people, you're friendly. People say, oh, how wonderful. Well, how wonderful it is that this this, his, his father, that's what the Gemara says, that's what the way it was. His father who taught him Torah, look what a beautiful person this is because he learns Torah. But if a person learns Torah and he does mitzvot, but he cheats in business, and he's, he doesn't get along, he's, he's gruff, he's mean, he's not friendly. People say, ugh, learning Torah. If you learn Torah, you turn into a, this is a terrible thing. And the, I've, I've asked like, like 50 people, no one's been able to, say that I'm wrong if somebody can. The, the implication of the Gemara is if you're going to be, um, you're, you're going to be not honest and you're going to be not nice and you're going to cause people to look down on you, it would be better not to keep the mitzvot of the Torah. Because by keeping the mitzvot of the Torah, it's a chil Hashem. We know people always say, if he's not religious, okay. It doesn't reflect on Torah. But when there's somebody, I hate to use the, the stereotypes, but you, I, you'll, you'll know, what, you'll know what I have where I'm I'm coming from you know, a guy with a long beard and a, and a, and a big keeper and the talus over the head and does something um, very unbecoming, it's much, much worse. So, so um, that's what the Dinitziv is alluding to this idea the, that they were tzaddikim and not yisharm. And that's what caused it to be much stick the deen of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. That's why God had to destroy them. So that's how he explains Sinat. You can do tremendous acts of kindness. They, they did. But it's got to be be universal. You can't only do acts of kindness to your own um, your own community. And this is is a beautiful, you know. Nitziv. I first heard this from Rabbi Blau, actually, the Mashkiach 
at Yeshiva University. I think he was the first one. I, I didn't know it growing up. I had never heard of, uh, I didn't really know much about the Nitzib growing up. We, didn't, we weren't exposed to him in school. When I came to Yeshiva in Israel, a lot of people had the, the Chumash of the Nitzib, the Amit Dover. That's when I first sort of heard, heard about him. And, um, and I remember Rabbi Blau saying, you know, it should be posted on the entrance to every shul. You know, um, this, this Nitziv is, you know, to welcome you into shul. But anyway, so that's um, Sinad HaBriot. So that can kill you. Yetzer Hara, Ein Hara, Sinad HaBriot um, can kill you. Okay, the Rambam has a different definition of Sinat HaBriot. It didn't say Sinat Chinam. I mean, that was, the, the Bartonora said it's the same, Sinat Briot. And by the way, Sinat Briot is a broader category. Um, it includes all of creations. It's not just like, like, you know, you know, people, but okay. Um, the Rambam says, Sinat Briot is, it's a, it means you don't like people. Not that I'm, I'm negative, it's a, it's, it's a similar idea. Um, it's a person's a loner. You have nothing to do with the community. See, not everyone, I don't care. I, 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 you leave me alone. Everybody knows it. You have neighbors. They don't want to talk to anybody. They don't want to say hello to you, et cetera, like that. So that's, um, um, that's how he explains it. It's interesting. The Rambam is the one who, on the, if you learn Hilchot Shuva, so the Rambam makes it clear. Rav Soloveitchik has a whole article about this, the distinction between, um, or the, the parallel tracks of the individual to do tshuva and the, the community to, to, to do tshuva. Individuals have to work on themselves. And community, the Ram, the halach is the sir mishtaleach, the, the goat um, on Yom Kippur, um, atones even for people who don't repent. That's how the Rambam, you know, Paskins, except for very, very serious sins, karet, um, it atones. And why does it atone? Because as long as you're part of a community, you get atonement as part of the community, even if you yourself are a sinner. Karet means I've separated from the community. A Jew who doesn't have a brit milah saying I'm not really, really Jewish, right? The, the 36 sins of the Torah, most of them meant most of them are either sexual sins, actually, we were talking about before, or Avodah Zara, the, these two areas. Those, most of the 36 karates are either in different forms of idol worship or misworship of God, um, or it involves different forms of sexual immorality. Then you have like eating on Yom Kippur, eating on, a Jew who eats on Yom Kippur means I'm not part of the Jewish people. Eating chametz on Pesach. A Jew who doesn't keep kosher, okay, he doesn't keep kosher. It's not, uh, it doesn't remove him from part of the people. So that's what the Rambam says. As long as you don't do a surkarate, um, your sins are atoned, even if you, um, you, can, you know, you, you eat ham and bacon and, you know, and you shave with the ray, I don't know, you do all kinds of things that are inappropriate and you don't dive in, who knows what. Um, that's the kapara of the, the tzibur. So it's very, I think when the Rambam is saying that, um, sinat b'yam means you're not part of the community and that's a, a terrible thing. You have to be part of the community. Community influences, hopefully, to do um, well. The Bartonora then adds another explanation. Um, what does it mean, Sinat Briot? To act in a way that people will hate you. It's a, sort of an interesting explanation. Sinat Briot means you don't care what people think about you. You act in a way, it's also, obviously you're, that happens when you're not nice, but to act in a way that you don't care what people have to think um, about you on the, okay, all right, that's, uh, that's enough, I think, for that, Mishnah. Ein hara, uh, look well on other people. Yetzer Hara is good if it's used properly. By the way, the Yetzer HaTov is, can also be improper. We, we do the al Chait, um, al Yetzer HaTov also. Sometimes the desire to do good can be too much, can be actually a little bit, bit sinful. So everything in its proper pr proportion. We need a Yetzer Hara, but not too much, not to run loose. The Gemara says the, the Torah is the tavlin of the Yetzer Hara. God created a Yetzer Hara. We need it. Yetzer Hara is good, very good. But then we have to channel it. And the way we channel the Yetzirah is through Torah. That's how the Gemara in Tani, I should have said that earlier. That's how the Gemara in Tani explains it, that the Yetzirah, the Torah, channels our Yetzirah. Yes, so everything, or the Gemara in Chulin says that for everything that was God gave a prohibition, he gave something else which is similar you are allowed to do. In other words, God doesn't negate our desires. He just channels them into a certain area. And that's true in every area of life. So we have ways to, um, to satisfy our Yetzir Hara, but it's got to be done in the proper way of, of Torah. So the Yetzir Hara is needed. Ein Hara, we don't need so much. That I don't think is good at all. And Sinat Abriyot is not good at all either. Okay, let's move on to the next Mishnah. Uh, for those who live in Canada, I think it's a, a very appropriate Mishnah for uh, what's going on in the headlines here. 
Rabbi Yossi Omer, Yehim Amon Chavercha Chaviv Alach Kishala, that the money of your friend should be as dear as your own money. Prepare yourself to learn Torah Shena Yerushalach. It's not an inheritance to you. And uh, everything you do should be for the sake of heaven. Okay, so the first thing he says, Rav Yossi, again, the, continuing the five students of Yerushalach and Zakai, the money of others should be as dear to you as your own money. Uh, that's, uh, I, that doesn't need any commentary. <laughs> you have to be uh, careful with other people's money. Uh, what it means that we've discussed, it means that especially people who have the ability, what, what can I do with your money? So, uh, okay, it means if I'm, uh, I'm, I'm uh, working in the investment industry. So I'll, I'll make investment suggestions to you that aren't in your best interest because it gives me a big commission or I try to sell you a house that's not really appropriate so I can make money. So obviously those would be violations of these notions and, uh, and giving bad advice, you know, obviously you'd violate. But uh, most people, I can't really, uh, I can't affect your money. What do you mean I should be careful with your money? Bill, Bill Gates doesn't ask me to spend his money. Like I said, I have to be careful. But uh, what it means is uh, if uh, you work in government and you have billions or trillions of dollars to spend, and how do you spend it? Do you, uh, you know, when you go on trips, do you pay for it yourself or do you have charities pay for your trips? What, what do you do? How do you, you know, how do you spend money or do you get the, the, the taxpayer to pay for your taxes in your swimming pool in your private residence? That's uh, mean, are you careful with the money of others that you're with careful with yourself that you would spend? It's uh, rather obvious. And, um, but um, I like, uh, we always say, especially in Perkei what the obvious needs stating the most, the Mesila to Sharm, that's his introduction. The, the, what's considered today the most popular, greatest Musar Sefer, the Ramachav, Ramosha Chaim Lutzato, the Mesila to Yisharm, the path of the, of the straight, however they, they translate it. So he writes, he's not going to say anything new. Everything I read in this book, everybody knows. And, uh, but the, we, we have to say what's, uh, what's important over and over again. Everybody knows that. Unfortunately, the, the Nazis thought that a lot. That's how propaganda works. You say it over, you have to say the same ideas over and over again. The Vilna Gaon made a, a cute comment. The Vilna Gaon said that uh, point, uh, Mr. Jeremy, he's wrong. It's not true that everything he writes in the book is well known. He had such great insights, they weren't well known. Okay, whatever. But um, so, but that's rather obvious, but it's very hard. It's very hard to be careful with other people's money. Everybody knows that. Or, you know, it's the idea we steal from the, the public. You know, out of the old, you know, when I was a kid, you go to a hotel, you take the, the soap with you or the towels or whatever. You know, who cares? Or, you know, because pe people aren't, you know, the same person would never in a million years, you know, like pickpocket or steal your money. That same person will might cheat on their taxes, or that same person might declare and not make a declaration of the border, because you're not really stealing, you know, you're just taking from the public, which of course is worse. Halakhically, that's worse, we don't feel it, and we know the Gemara says you can't do any tshuva for that, because uh, even if I pay back the money, you know, the budget was set and how many CAT scan machines they're going to have, in other words, I, I can't, when you harm the public, you can't pay back, because you, you're paying back to, the public is always changing. So, okay, be careful. And, uh, okay. I find this a fascinating expression. Prepare yourself to learn Torah. It's not your inheritance. So maybe I'll start with the second part. Torah is not an inheritance. Sometimes it is. Torah Tzivalanu Moshe Morashaki Lach Yaakov. It is an inheritance. By the way, it's not an inheritance. That's the, the difference between a Morasha and a Yerusha. Torah Tzivalanu Moshe, it's a Morasha. It's a heritage. A heritage is something you have to pass on to another. A Yerusha is you get money from your parents and you spend it however you want. So the Torah is a Morasha, but it's not a Yerusha. But it also, it, it's, they're, they're talking about totally different things. The Torah is not an inheritance. In other words, if you want to, here we're talking about the, the, the study of Torah. You don't get it by osmosis. Just because your father was a Torah scholar or your mother doesn't mean you'll become uh, um, a, a Torah scholar. As a matter of fact, the Gemara in the Darim, says, why is it that usually the children of great Torah scholars are not great Torah scholars? Usually the children don't measure up to the parents. Um, Moshe Rabbeinu, I mean, you want to start with Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu's children, actually, uh, in Pasuk and Shoftim, Rashi points out, were involved in, in a Vodazara. It's almost, when people hear this for the first time, they flip out. What, are you crazy? But if you look in, I think, in the 18th parak in Shoftim, there's a, 
a Menashe by, by, by Pesel Micha, I think. There's a whole story there, and it's spelled Menashe, and the Nun is hanging, and it's B'nai Menashe, and the Rashi says it's really B'nai Moshe. They just put in the Nun to cover up for Moshe. Of course, he's revealing to cover up. In other words, it's an allusion to Moshe, because the children of Moshe who did idol worship. But as I said, idol worship in the time of the Beam often meant the yearning for God, just misplaced. But uh, their children, you know, they didn't become of much. But okay, for, forget Moshe Rabbeinu. The Gemara says that very rarely is it that great Torah scholars have children who are great Torah scholars. So people should know. Torah is not a Yerusha. Torah is not an inheritance. It's not like money. It's also not true. Uh, also money, you know, 85% of businesses don't make it to, to a third generation. I think at most 15% make of, of successful businesses. Uh, everybody knows successful businesses. We, we know in our, 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 our lifetime, uh, so and I made the misfortune of buying Research in Motion. You remember that company, right? The, be, before BlackBerry. So I bought shares in Research in Motion. No, no, what can you do? Um, you know, it was the world's leading company. It made Apple look like a joke. And now it's uh, barely hanging on. So uh, things turn upside down. But the Gemara says that, that Torah is not a Yerusha. You have to work hard on it. And the way to work hard is to see all these great Torah scholars. Their children are not Torah scholars. Uh, I don't know. I haven't done a statistical study. Um, I, it often is true, but I think in recent generations, it's probably less true. Probably we live in an era, I would say the last, maybe, I don't know, last couple hundred years, hundred years where, you know, you think of families and often the kids don't measure up, but um, I would say usually the kids don't measure up, but it, it, there, it does seem to have an advantage if your parents were great Torah scholars, um, your father great Torah scholars. I, but I think enough isn't, and I think if it does, it's actually a distortion of what the Torah is meant to be. In other words, the the learning Torah is meant to be democratic. Um, I've mentioned this before. Um, people have a misconception, especially, let's say, take 19th century Eastern European yeshiva, Balazhin, let's say. We're talking about the Nasiv, the great yeshiva in Balazhin. The vast majority of students who studied in Balazhin were wealthy. Because if you weren't in enough money, you couldn't afford it. I mean, the whole Kolo system is only because people have money. We're in the richest Jewish community in the history of the world. So, um, um, you know, people went to work at 14, at 12, became a parent. Who, well, who went learning? That was like unheard of. And who could afford it? And I mentioned very often when a rabbi negotiated a contract, part of the contract was how many students he would be allowed to learn with. How much could the community afford? How much? Uh, how big is the day school? We can only afford the. We talk about day school. It's the same problem. Not everybody got quote unquote in the day school education. A lot of the haters were terrible schools. We know that. Um, and it was um, not all of them. And and only people who had money. So the people who learned in yeshivas were often very very well connected. And even and and if they didn't have so much money, or someone was really really bright. And they felt he could go in yeshiva, so he would marry into wealthy families. That's that's how it worked. The the wealthy, the they wanted a you know a tamal for their 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 daughter. But that's not really how Torah was sort of meant to be. So in such a system, you're going to create much more of a. That was in Nani Helkot Shir yesterday in Malachim dynasties. You know, like one one child uh, you know inherits the Rosh Hashiva. That's not good. I think one of the great things of Yeshiva University is how. There, it's not a family business. Most yeshivas are, and I, I don't mean to disparage it. I mean, I, I don't agree with the approach, but but I understand how it happened. But most, many of the great yeshivas are, are really family business. I'm, I'm not saying they're in it to make money, God forbid. Don't, that's not what I mean. But they're owned and controlled by the families. And um, the son becomes, or the son-in-law becomes an extra yeshiva. And I, I don't have to name yeshivas. The greatness of yeshiva university is not like that at all. There, there's a board of directors, an independent. Uh, there's almost nobody in the yeshiva where a father and son taught in the yeshiva. I mean, Rav, Rav Salavechik, okay, Rav, Rav, Rav Moshe Salavechik and Rav Yosef Dovber Salavechik. But uh, almost none of the rebbeim. People there are on merit, and many of the come from families where their parents, you know, were not great Torah scholars. So that's how to, that's going to work. But when we have a system, only the wealthy can learn. It's not like that. Anyways, that's a I pardon if you don't agree with my social commentary, you can ignore that. But hopefully the, the, the Torah you'll agree with. But what the Mishnah is saying is Torah is not a Yerush. You've got to work hard. Anybody who is a Tamach Chacham, even if they have the advantage, and of course it helps, of a parent who's a great scholar. You know, I think it was in Malcolm Gladwell's book, you know, uh, Outliers. It's a, a fascinating book. I don't know how many people read it. You know, where he shows the, the trends in society. You know, he starts on the hockey one. That's the 
we're living in Canada. I think the hockey season starting next week. Baseball started last night. No, I won't comment on any of that. But um, so, you know, he, he pointed out that most NHL hockey players, at least years ago when they were all, all Canadian, I guess, you know, you know, 75% were born January, February, March. I think I once mentioned that birthdays because everything's the luck of the draw because when you're six years old in peewee hockey and they make the all-star team so the guy born in january is going to be better at december you know go by the year this the school year in grade one the kid born in january is a huge advantage over a kid born in december he's like like 20 percent older than he is you know in grade 13 or grade 12 you know, grade 13, it doesn't really matter anymore but in grade one and two it matters that's why some parents sometimes pull back their kids kid born in January, they don't want the kid to be the oldest. Um, I'm sorry, they want the kid to be the oldest in the class. They, 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 they don't want to push ahead necessarily. So um, um, anyway, so he, 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 he writes there, to be a major league baseball player, if your, uh, your father was a major league baseball player, you have an 800 times greater chance of being a baseball player yourself. We all know that in, in sports, how many fathers and sons and brothers the Southern brothers, six brothers made it to the NHL. Okay, pardon my, my sports analogies. But, um, but so there clearly does help if your parents are great tourist scholars. But so the, that's why the guards going out of the way. So many are not. And that's true even today. So many great tourist scholars have children who are, I don't want to say are nobodies, but they don't measure up in learning. Okay, now what's Hatkenat Mechalumot Torah? Prepare yourself to learn Torah. Like it's an interesting expression. So I think what it means, and this is we've uh, discussed a little bit, you know, the greatness of Dafyomi, but the the the, the pitfalls in Dafyomi. Prepare yourself to learn Torah. It's not enough to learn Torah. I, I mean, that's that's wonderful. You have to have a system. You have to prepare. I, I want to accomplish something. What's the best way to accomplish it? And you have to have, what am I going to learn? What's the curriculum going to be? And by the way, that is a major fault in many of the yeshivas. You just learn. Because when yeshivas were only for the elite, in Valashin, in order to get into Valashin, my understanding was you had to pass a test of 400 blood. That's 400 double-sided pages, Gemara, Rashi, and Tosva. You know, a faher, as they say. You had to pass that. And then you can come into yeshiva. And then, then today, most people who, got, who get smicha would fail such a test. Um, so just, um, you know, and that was the entrance exam. You know, I don't know exactly, whatever, they, they examine people. Um, you know, the, yeah, so they didn't need a curriculum. When you're brilliant, you don't need a curriculum. But average people need a, 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 a curriculum. They have to, I, I actually, if I can say that, I think that's one of the major advantages of the university over the yeshiva. In, 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 in yeshivas, often the goal is the kids should learn. And in the university, the goal is the kids should learn something. In other, words, when, in other words, in yeshiva, that he's learning, not knowledge per se, that he's learning. He's engaged in the act of learning. It's the mitzvah of Talmud Torah. It's not what he learns. And the university focuses on accomplishments. You have to finish a curriculum. Very few yeshivas have a curriculum. There were great, there are Russian yeshivas who, don't, who do have that. Many yeshivas Disdain test. I saw, I know I got an email recently. I don't know, so many email lists. So some yeshiva was writing, you know, in our yeshiva, they're opening up, I think, in the yeshiva for American kids. In our yeshiva, no test. Or I think maybe it was a high school, a new high school. No, no test, because, you know, tests are bad. I, I don't know. I, that, that's not, had, in my vision, that's not had kenat smalil motorah. You have to have a plan. And as I met Rav Zevin in his, one of his beautiful articles, all his articles are beautiful. Rav, Rav Zevin writes that there's a mitzvah to learn Torah, but there's also a mitzvah to know Torah. They're two separate mitzvot. Um, hopefully, if you're smart, you can do them both at the same time. But um, there is something to be engaged in Torah, even if you don't learn. Schar halicha, going to a shir you don't understand. Seeing the power of Torah, being engaged with other people. That's beautiful, even if you yourself gain very little. That's, that's a nice mitzvah. But there's a second mitzvah to know Torah. And for that Torah, you have to be hatkein atzmecha. You have to prepare yourself. You have to plan in advance. And the Mishnah, in Pirkei Avot, does that. The Mishnah says a great, at the age of five, you start on Tanakh. At the age of 10, you start Torah Shabbat Peh. To start Torah Shabbat Peh, before 10, kids are too young. And you know what? Torah Shabbat Peh means the Mishnah, means straight halacha. This is what you do. This is what you don't do. These are the 39 milachot of Shabbat. To discuss Yehu Shalomi Dat, to discuss Gemaras, that's on the age of 15. And the, um, that's what the Gemara says, uh, the, the Mishnah. Why we've totally changed that system is a very good question. It was probably not such a good idea. The one who rallied against this 
this working away from a curriculum was the Marala Prague. The Marala Prague was very upset. The Marala Prague was very upset that the uh, the, the the the, the Marala Prague died in 1609, if I'm not mistaken, and um, um, the, and he lived, I think, uh, quite an uh, old, he lived a, a long life. So um, the Marala Prague. Uh, the printing presses, the first Talmud was printed in 1523. No, so what gets printed on the side of the Talmud? So Rashi, okay, Rashi has to get printed. What, what's next? <coughs> no, I don't know. So they printed Tosfat. So many people were very up to them. I thought this is terrible. Tosfat, that's dialectical learning, complicated, complex, and nothing to do with the duck. Tosfat doesn't explain what you're learning. I, I mean, Tosfat says what you're learning, Ah, oh, how can you say this? There's a Gemara in a different tractate that says something else that contradicts. So I'm going to give you an answer. This Gemara is talking about it. You, know, you can totally understand your Gemara without Tosh. You can't understand the Gemara without Rashi. Why not put uh, the Rosh? Why, why not put other commentaries that explain the top? So the Gemara was very, he it said it, it, it hurt the learning because kids were started asking all kinds of questions. They weren't learning the proper things. It's interesting, you know, how these things happen, you know, what the influence is. By the way, the Mara's brother, Rabbi Bitzalel, I think was his name. Um, he was uh, like, it sounds like today. I mean, when it, this was, it's, it's, you smile. Uh, he thought the printing press was terrible. Just like people thought the internet was terrible. I said, terrible, it's gonna destroy Judaism, the printing press. Why will it destroy Judaism? So he had two concerns. Number one is you don't need rabbis, Rabbi Google, Rabbi Printer. You don't need, who, who, who needs a teacher anymore? I just opened up my uh, Sansino Talmud. That's what it was called, right? That's why Sansino City in Italy, printing presses. I opened my, wasn't well, in English, but uh, I opened up my Sansino or the, you know, um, Talmud, and I don't need a rabbi. Number two, he was very afraid. Remember that, um, that, that, that Spartic culture would overwhelm Ashkenazi culture. There were many more Spartan in the world then. So the, the generation after the expulsion from Spain, Spain, I think, had 90% of world Jewry. Um, so the, the Spartan greatly outnumbered Ashkenazi. And it's very people are going to read, oh, I'm going to eat kidney on, on Pesach. Why do I have to follow these Minhagim and worms and mines? Let's eat kidney on Pesach. Let's uh, do this. Let's do that. So it's very, uh, we, we laugh at this because how, 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 how ridiculous when we get the printing press. And we laugh at people who are against the, uh, the internet because it's uh, against the, you can't be against these things. Of course, at the time, everybody's against, but it, it becomes so real. So anyways, um, so you have to have a whole system. Tomorrow was very upset and he felt the printing of Tos, but there needs a curriculum to learn, not just learn. And, and you know what? Not everybody has to learn Kamara. The idea that every man is doing tomorrow, this is a modern post-World War II innovation. Never in history was it expected that everybody learned tomorrow. Okay, enough of my uh, personal comment. I know Pirkei Avot gives me the uh, ability or the curse or to really, you know, give my own much more editorial comments than if I was giving a Chumashir or a Lachashir, but whatever. Okay, let's just do a little bit more, then I'll take the questions and we'll wrap up. Um, where are we up to here? So, um, Everything you do should be the sake of heaven. So we discussed already the importance of L'Shem Shemaim, that we said it really doesn't matter if you do it for the wrong reasons. It's, it's good to do mitzvah. I mean, it's fine to do mitzvah for the wrong reason is because from the wrong reason you come to the right reason. We explained, I think, even last week or two weeks ago, that's only normal people. Leaders, uh, we started with leadership and being concerned with money of others. Leaders, it's very different. Leaders have to be properly motivated. Me and you don't have to be properly motivated. But the people in, in government have to be extremely properly motivated because every decision they make hurts people by definition. You give money here, you take money there. That's what they have to do. That's fine. Not, not, nothing wrong with that. As long as they're doing it um, and, and the shame shemaim. You can make a difficult decision. The decision might even be wrong. But at least you're you're purely motivated. That's okay. So that's uh, one type. You but obviously you should do me about the shem shemaim. But the truth of the matter, the commentaries, that's not what our Mishnah is talking about. This idea of doing mitzvah. That was the idea. When you do something, a mitzvah, doing it lishma, not lishma. Here the commentaries are explaining when we're talking about our quote unquote our secular activities. When we eat, when we play. Uh, we do things that should be done also l'shem shemaim. In other words, 
it's worshiping God, you have to have a wholesome life, lifestyle. You have to, you have to exercise. The, the Rambam Paskins, that, uh, if I can use that term, a Jew has to exercise every day. That's how shmartem l'nashotechem. You know, my, uh, somebody told me the other day, they're more concerned with eating healthy than keeping kosher. I said, great. That's what it says in the Shulchan Aruch. That's what the Shulchan Aruch says. The Shulchan Aruch, in the beginning of Yoradei and Chelek Bey, says uh, it's based on the Gemara. The Gemara, the Shulchan Aruch didn't make it up. Gadol Sakanta um, Me'isura. Um, Something that is dangerous is more prohibited. The Shulchan Aruch, there's a whole list of things you're not allowed to do because it's, it's, it's dangerous. Something that's more dangerous, you have to be more careful than the prohibition. So you eat pork, big, I don't want to say big deal, but I mean, but, uh, but I, I, I can say that in a crowd where people keep kosher, you know? So you eat pork, it's not gonna, it's not gonna harm you. I mean, harm you, of course, in a spiritual sense, whatever, but I mean, even that's hard to measure. It's not gonna harm you, but if you do things that are, are dangerous, so that you have to, so you have to live a healthy lifestyle, but everything you do when you exercise, that can also be done the shem shem you know? Um, I, you know, Rev, Rev Lichtenstein used to play, play basketball. Or when I was in uh, Orchaim, when I went to high school in Toronto, Rev Tabori Lava Shalom, my, my Rosh Hashiva, he was, a, he was a great baseball, he was a great baseball fan. And he was a very good basketball player. And we used to play, of course, what do kids do in high school? We were more interested in basketball than in tomorrow. Most normal, whatever, most kids, I don't know. Um, so, um, you know, but he used to play, play basketball with us on occasion because, um, it, it's not just to be one of the boys and to et cetera, but also how you play basketball can say a lot about a person. How a person drives can tell you, you know, there are mitot in everything you do. Every, even eating, drinking, playing baseball, what, whatever you do can be done with Shem Shem. So that's what the Mishnah says there. Chom There's this idea when you do mitzvot. Sometimes you do mitzvot, not the shem shemaim. And that's, we said, that's the whole thing. Okay, it's not ideal, but it's fine, as long as you're not harming people in the way. That's to do mitzvot, not the shem shemaim. Mitzvot ideally the shem shemaim, but even eating and our activities should be done um, the shem shemaim. Okay, um, let me just see. I think maybe there were a couple of questions here, not too many, and then I can just do a quick review. Is there a Hebrew equivalent word for the Yiddish of shtender? I have no idea. I, I am, they don't have shtenders anymore so much, do they, right? I don't, how do you say shtender in English? I don't even know. Uh, the shtender, right? That, the, where, where the chaz and from. When, when I came to high school, we used to learn from a, a, a shtender. I can't believe it. It's like hard to believe. They, you didn't have, have a table yet. Like, uh, I don't know what the word is in English. Um, a wooden thing, you know, what like the chaz and from. Anyways, I don't know. A podium, really, podium. A podium. podium. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. No. no. Okay. Thank you, Howard. Okay. I believe it was Rava and not Rav who made the share with the joke. Um, I have to check. I know it's in Shabbos day. If you're right, I will ap apologize. Um, okay. What's that question, Rav Lichtenstein? What does the Rav think? And he gave me a lengthy interview of salvation. He needed to clarify that I was seeking his opinion and not that of his father-in-law. Okay. I'm not sure in what context was. Yeah, his opinion. By the way, the, the Rob expected people to form their own opinions, um, whatever. Is there a discussion about a keeper should look like? No, I don't think so. I mean, uh, unfortunate, unfortunate I, maybe it's unfortunate. I, a keeper has become very much, um, it's, it's symbols. Like I will say, um, Rav Soloveitchik has a beautiful idea the, um, about the Israeli flag, right? I'll, I'll just I'll say this for a minute. Um, Rav Moshe Feinstein, who was not a Zionist, uh, Rav Moshe Feinstein, the greatest post in America, an unbelievable person, but uh, Hashka, you know, he wasn't in the modern Orthodox, what we would call the modern Orthodox religious Zionist world. Okay, it was later. So Rav Moshe was asked if you can have an Israeli flag in a shul. You know, somebody got upset, the rabbi put an Israeli flag, you know, uh, the kaif. so Rav, Rav Moshe writes this unbelievable tshuva. Rav Moshe writes, you know, of course the Zionists were terrible people and they wanted to uproot Torah. You know, that was the mindset, the secular Zionists. And it was not totally false. They wanted to uproot Torah, create a secular Jew. They took all the Moroccan Jews. They sent them to secular kibbutzim. The Zionists were evil, terrible people, of course. Nonetheless, um, it's, we don't want to have them a machloket about it, and you're not allowed to make a fight about it, and it's okay, they have the Israeli flag, they have the American flag, and Shul Beseder, you shouldn't leave and make an issue over it. Rav uh talked about the Israeli flag, so he said the Israeli flag has holiness to it, kedusha to it, 
what Rav Soloveitchik was from the religious Zionist world, of course. And um, Rav Soloveitchik explained based on, on a Rambam. The Rambam says that um, if a Jew, Chas V'Sholom, is murdered by non-Jews, you bury him in his bloodstained clothes to be Mu'ora the Rachami, to get the mercy of God. So you bury this person, you don't take off the clothes, he gets buried in the blood. And he said the Israeli flag, unfortunately, is wrapped with so much blood. So the Israeli flag has the Kiddusha, and therefore um, the flag itself becomes holy. So symbols can become very important. So a kippah, halachically, I mean, you don't even have to, I, I'm, again, Rav Moshe Feinstein has a well-known tshuva. I don't think it's really true anymore. I don't know if he would write the same thing. That if it's going to impede your job prospects, you don't have to wear a, a kippah. And as in the 80s, when, I, when my friends were going on interviews in law firms and uh, in New York, it was very well known. All, everybody told them to take off their kippahs. I, I know people. They went on job interviews wearing, wearing kippahs. They went on five interviews and got no job offers. Then they went on three interviews with their kippahs off and they got three job offers. Coincidence? I don't know. Um, so, you know, that um, Rav Moshe writes a keep it's a minag, it's okay, you don't have to lose any livelihood over it. Today, Park, I don't think that's true. Today, we live in a multicultural society. People can dress how they want, what they want. So, I don't think it really harms you. Um, but I, I, on the other hand, um, the the Taz, uh, living in the 17th century, has a famous comment that not to wear it, that's what Moshe says, it isn't true anymore. That's what Rav Moshe is discussing. He's right with the Taz. The Taz, the commentary on the Shulchan Aruch, the Rav David Siegel, the, the Turi Zahab, so he, 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 was a, he was a Levi, so he says that not to wear a kippah is a biblical prohibition of Chukar Goim. Wow. Biblical prohibition of Chukar Goim. Why? Because the goyim insists when you go to church, you have to uncover your head. You know, they play the national anthem. You know, you have to take your kippah. You have to take your hat off when they play the national anthem. So that's a, that's a religious, non-Jewish custom. So a Jew who goes with bareheaded, that's a biblical violation. Wow. So Ramosha, they're not true anymore. And then there's symbols can have halakhic implications later on. But no, there is no halakhic about a kippah. By the way, a friend of mine once said that's probably the reason why only men and women don't wear kippot generally because the custom, he said that the kippot was really a reaction to the, 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 the church. And in, in the gospels, it says that men, when they enter the church, have to take off their head, their, they can't have head coverings. It was only addressed to men, correct is only men. Um, this is what he, he told me, you know, only men went to church. So the, if the, the men had to take off their kippah, so Jewish men, the Dafka wore a kippah, you know, and the Pope, of course, wears a, a, a kippah. There is something, but only the Pope, I guess, whatever. So no, is there any discussion about what a kippah should look like? I don't think so. So if, if you like, it, uh, if you like here, I have a kippah suruga, so I guess I am identifying with the religious Zionist movement. Okay, that's who I want to identify with, whatever. But I think we make way too much out of it, unfortunately. Okay, is Rabbi Lezer relating to the way he was treated to the Avena Bachnai. Um, somebody asked me privately, you're asking in terms of what? To be careful with your friend. Very interesting. Rabbi Eliezer says, be very honor of your friend. Maybe he's a reaction to the way they mistreated him. Could very well be. Um, okay, very interesting. Is this Taurus? Uh, yeah. When the rabbis pray for sexual drive to go away, the chickens stop playing games. Yeah, that's what we said. Only about 2,000 years before Crazy Jane Bishop. I'm not sure what that means. Karet was Rashi Tevot. No, Karet just means to be cut off. And Nichrotu, Lichrot. You cut off, there are 36 uh, things in the Torah you get Karet for. 34 of them are prohibitions. Two of them are positive mitzvot. If you die or don't do um, a brit milah, and then bring a korban pesach. And you know, one who doesn't have a brit milah can't bring the korban pesach. 34 I, negative, 44. I think I found yes. it. I've said, it's, if somebody wants to ask, I'll give you one second. That's it. Yeah. Just let, let me quickly review sure. very, very quickly. We talked about Ein Hara, things that can kill you, take you from this world, the way you look at others, being jealous, the Yetzir Hara, when the Yetzir Hara is good, when the Yetzir Hara is not good, and the praying to get rid of the Yetzir Hara for Avodah Zara, its impact on our worship of God, um, but we need a little bit of Yetzir Hara, even a Yetzir Hatov, it isn't always good, hatred of people, so hatred of people can be apathy, it's the opposite of love, we discussed in the Sieve's introduction what Sinat Chinam means, it's, it's, it's selective. The, you can do, as the people did, you can do chesed and still be full of, of sinat kinam. They're not contradictory um, ideas. 
And then we discussed a little bit, careful with other people's money, of course, to prepare yourself to learn Torah. Torah is not an inheritance. Children often aren't following in the path, don't, aren't blessed uh, to be great Torah scholars. Everything we do should be um, L'Shem Shemaim, not just in the religious, what we call religious, in Judaism, we don't really distinguish in religion and secular. Playing baseball can also be a religious activity. It's done in the prospect of living a, a proper, healthy life, lifestyle. It's all wonderful. Okay, uh, I'll, I'm happy to take questions.